I'm Pax. I'm the founder and editor of Queer Toronto Literary Magazine. Today I'm excited to be sitting down with singer, actor, producer, recording artist, local drag legend, and HIV and AIDS activist, Jade Electra. Uh, this is part of Cutie's Black History Month series, profiling Black queer trailblazers in the arts. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. How are you doing today? How's it going? Uh, good. It's been a day of recordings. Uh, I just did a, um, uh, a, I was a panelist for a, about HIV positive um, hookups during COVID uh, and also party and play. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. So last time we sort of talked about gay history and black queer history and the importance of that. And you really can't talk about gay history without drag queens. And you can't talk about drag history without Paris is Burning. It is Correct. the movie. Um, but I would also say the source material, guidebook, whatever you want to call it, on modern queer culture. Can you talk about the impact of the movie on your own life? Uh, well, honestly and truly, um, the movie inspired me to come to New York. Um, I was living in Tampa, Florida, and um, it, was, it wasn't that there wasn't a gay scene there. Uh, there was. Um, and at one point, uh, I was kind of in the, the big leagues of the scene, like everyone knew me and all that. Mm. Uh, and I was quite fashionable, but I wasn't, it wasn't for drag. It was for, like, I was this androgynous kind of thing showing up at the clubs. Uh, and uh, I, I was really into thrifting back then. So anything that I found at a thrift store, I would turn it into an outfit. And that became the look for the Saturday night at the El Goya in Tampa, Florida. Uh, but uh, at one point, it, I, I sort of felt like I was a big fish in a small pond. And there was no other place for me to go. And I dreamed of like a big city. And then I saw Paris is Burning and I saw people of color, mm. like large groups of people of color, like coming together and doing these competitions. And just it just made me really believe that, like, this is where I need to be. I need to be where these things are happening. So um, that and also there was a boyfriend that I had met there who moved to New York. Uh, so um I got to New York and I just literally fell into the, the scene. Um, uh, the person that I lived with was a queen named uh, The Electrifying Grace. And uh, I had, <laughs> coming from Tampa, Florida, where I had a two bedroom apartment, a parking spot, even though I didn't have a car, right. <laughs> uh, all this stuff. I had no concept of someone living in a room like, that was her existence. She lived in a room. And above her was Paris Dupree. Wow. And this was actually, uh, I didn't realize that at the time, but it was housing for HIV positive people. And it was right on 46 uh, near 8th Avenue. And uh, so I, I came and stayed with her. I, uh, an ex-boyfriend of mine was her boyfriend. He told me it was okay for me to come up. I happened to call. She was like, uh, oh, you're coming to New York. I was like, yeah, where are you, where are you staying? I was like, uh, with you? <laughs> and she's like, you can't be coming to stay with us. So we're in a room or whatever. And I, you know, I'm still not thinking really a room. And, right, uh, but right. by the time I got there, she had broken up with uh, my ex, Michael, and kicked him out. So I was coming to stay with a complete stranger that I had only spoken to on the phone. And uh, she was like kind of one of the show directors at Sally's, which is in Paris is Burning. It's the drag bar that they performed at. And um, uh, she got me my first job. Um, and I, it was kind of crazy. Um, I was, um, I went in, uh, auditioned for this guy who looked like uh, Max from Heart to Heart, which is way before your time. Um, but if you ever look up the show, this guy's like, he was a character. What did the audition but, uh, process look like? Oh, I had like a couple of stacks of records with me, like a couple of handful of records with me. I'm going in and I'm thinking, this is New York City. I got to do my best tricks and right. mix and do all this stuff. So I spun for, for about an hour 
he was on the phone, he was eating spaghetti, he like he was not paying attention at all. So when I finished, I walked over to him and he's like, come here, kid. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, uh, sit down, tell me something. Do you know how to read? And I'm like, you know, I'm thinking in my head like, yeah, I know how to read. And he's like, no, 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 not that faggot shit. As in, as in C spot run. And I'm like, yeah, I know how to read. And he's like, okay, you're hired. What I did not know was that they had employed uh, ho- uh, hustler boys to be the DJs uh, during the week. And uh, most of those boys didn't know how to read. So they had to pay somebody else to sit with them to tell them what to play for the show. Wow. So this, they eliminated all of them and and kept me so i was working seven days a week at sally's and that's how i met dorian corey and angie extravaganza because angie extravaganza had a monday night show dorian corey had a uh, thursday night show um uh grace who i lived with she ran the talent show which was late night on monday and she had another show on tuesday uh and, and throughout the week uh this sally's it was a you know, politically incorrect terminology for today, but it was a tranny hooker bar. So there were all of these people that just came in and out. And then there were celebrities that came in. So like Sting and the Pet Shop Boys came in one time. Uh, uh, Tito Puentes Jr., I think, uh, came in. Um, uh, I met Delight, uh, Lady Miss Keir, and uh, DJ Dimitri there. Uh, it, it was like insane. Uh, David Cole from CNC Music Factory. Like people just came in and it was right in, it was on 43rd. Uh, it was across from the old Times building. Uh, and um, that shot of the two kids talking uh, yeah, at the beginning, I, that's, I exactly right, that's right in front of Sally's. That's where I worked. Where the one kid's like, I'm, I'm like 15, or the other one's like, I'm 13. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone just wrote me and asked me if I knew anything about them. And like, actually, I didn't. Uh, but uh, I found some kind of article. They tracked down the 13-year-old. Uh, and he's still alive, and he's well. No, we don't know what happened to the other one, though. Mm. Um, but that that the movie really kind of like, I don't know, it just... It, it was calling me to New York City, and I'm so glad that I did go. And I ended up, uh, uh, I wasn't doing drag when I first got there. And uh, Grace, who I was living with, got really sick, and they were going to have a benefit. And I mentioned to Dory and Corey that, oh, I used to do drag in Florida. And she's like, oh, well, you should do it for the benefit. And I was like, well, I don't have any clothes. And she's like, oh, well, we'll take care of that, darling. And the next thing I know, she brought me this dress, and then uh, like I did a, I remember there was a photographer named Brian Latem, uh, and I wish I could get a get a hold of him to get the photos. He took beautiful photographs of all of the queens that work there. Uh, there were murals on the walls uh, because this was part of the Hotel Carter. So this used to be the ballroom for the Hotel Carter, but now it was closed off. It was the ballroom and theater because it was a, a thing where you could, um, put the projector, uh, the screen down. Uh, and uh, w- literally, uh, uh, he took these great photographs uh, and he has some photographs of me. And this is like my first time in drag in New York City. Uh, and it was such a gorgeous photograph in this dress that Dorian made. And it's, uh, I still have the dress. It is a green sequence dress. And um, uh, I pull it out for rare occasions. Right. Um, uh, but it like had talked about her last we sort of talked about her a little bit last time but i i see her as like the main narrator of Paris yeah she yeah 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 defines uh, she defines shade what what was it like just knowing her and she was um, she she was amazing she was just full of knowledge she would you know and anyone who would listen she would just tell you uh, she was part of uh the jewel box review uh which was a, a drag troupe that uh, ran in Harlem back in the seventies wow. and, uh, um, just, you know, she was really all about costuming. So 
uh, most of her stuff, like her stage stuff, it was feathers and, yes. you know, all kinds of stuff. I have an ostrich feather and uh, ostrich feather and marabou uh, coat uh, that she made that I still have. Um, uh, she, everyone sort of kind of looked to her for like guidance. You know, they would go and talk to her about if they had problems or whatever. Uh, the interesting thing about the whole time that I knew her, which I didn't realize, I mean, we never discussed that she was HIV positive, but she only had four T cells. I had never heard of anything like that. She was like Can you working. Can explain that for someone who might not understand? Okay, you? so uh, um, they, the qualifications for full-blown AIDS is under 200 T cells. So now with like the meds that they have now, most people are undetectable. That means that your T cells are way up and you couldn't transfer the virus at all. This is back in the nineties and no healthcare, no nothing. Uh, and she was working. She was like, God knows how old she was. Uh, she had to have been in her sixties. Uh, and she was showing up every Thursday for her show and performing or whatever. Uh, and you know, when she died, uh, like that's when I found out about like, she was really ill and she only had like four T cells. And I'm like, how does someone function on four T cells? Mm -hmm. Um, but she did. And, um, and that's when the whole scandal came out after she died, when they were cleaning out her place and they found the dead body, uh, the, the mummy. Uh, and I had been in that room for fittings, had no idea. Uh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, I mean, it was, it, I, I, her place was like cluttered with trunks and everything because she had material to make dresses and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it just, it was a cluttered place. You didn't think about like, oh, there's a dead body. And like, no, I wouldn't have even imagined that right. at all. <laughs> So, We're and the, story, the realm of possibility. Yeah, and the story is is that it was a lover of hers back in the seventies who uh, got a little too rough. They got into a fight. She ended up killing him. And the best thing to not get charged if there's no body, they can't charge you. So she mummified the body, put it in a trunk, and kept it. And uh, you know, <laughs> I'm like wow. You were briefly a member of the House of Labasia, right? I was. I was. Uh, that night that I performed for um, Grace's benefit, uh, Peppa Labasia was there. And Peppa came up to me after my performance and said that I reminded her of herself when she was younger. And she was like, would you like to be in the House of Labasia? And I was like, yes. And so I ended, like I was inducted. I didn't have to walk a ball to get into the house. I was inducted into the house and I went to a few meetings or whatever, but what I discovered, uh, and I, I actually did walk a couple of balls because of, they didn't know me there. So I walked for Butch Queen first time in drags. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know that I had already done drag before. So this was, I was a fresh face. So you were like a New York virgin kind of thing. Right, right. And, um, so, you know, I, I did that, but I, what I discovered was I wasn't as co competitive as the rest. And there were so many other things that I wanted to do. And I, my DJ career was, I wanted to move from Sally's and get into like a real gay bar, which that was a process. Uh, one, because of all those spaces were already taken. All the DJs were already where they were supposed to be or already had the jobs. Uh, I left Sally's and went to Edelweiss, which was their competition, another tranny hooker bar. Uh, and, uh, and then I ended up working in a strip joint, uh, Legs Diamonds. Uh, and I was the DJ there and they loved me there. The owner, it was a woman who ran the place, which was really odd. I never knew of a woman owning a strip joint where women stripped. Right. Uh, but uh, she was, she was bisexual and <laughs> uh, she was, she was something. Uh, and, uh, but like, they loved me for working there because I wasn't sleeping with the girls. Right. All, of the, all the, uh, DJs before me were someone would hook up with one of the girls and then there would be favoritism for that girl right. when she went on stage and all that. So 
everybody was just everybody to me. I didn't care. And they liked it that I had no bias for anyone, you know, because none of it meant anything to me. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I worked there for a while. And then finally, I got a job at uh, The Hangar on Christopher Street. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I was their first DJ. And uh, and that's how I got into the scene that like the gay scene as far as DJing and I was at two potato which was one of the all black bars on Christopher Street. Um, I worked at another place called Chi Chi's. Uh, I was gonna ask about that. What was the difference DJing uh, in New York in terms of finding spa more spaces for people of color and black people in particular versus the scene in Florida? Uh, well, in Florida, I mean, it was limited. I was limited because of I was black. And until I worked at BVDs, the last place I worked for, I didn't actually get to show that I knew more than just black music or more than just, you know, the, the stuff that worked for the lesbian redneck bar that I converted uh, paradise. Um, uh, the difference was when I got to New York is that this was, these were black spaces so i could play as much r b music or house music or any of those things and no one was going to bat an eye as a matter of fact it was revered and i learned so much about what was a new york classic because i had no idea when i got there like there were certain songs like um first choice uh let no man put us under you could put that on anywhere in new york city somebody's gonna get up and start dancing <laughs> um follow me by alias that's that's a house classic new york classic you like these are things that are just standards like it doesn't matter what situation what party or whatever these are things that you're going to have to play if you want to get them up and you get wanna, them. Right. yeah so um it was i mean it, it was a, a great learning experience i loved all of the advice uh that I got from like Paris Dupree and from Willie Ninja and from uh, Peppa um, and uh, obviously Dorian uh, and the queen who took me in, Grace, they really sort of, you know, they, I, they could tell I was really green and, and didn't know wh what I was doing. So they really made sure like, oh, you know, hey, stop on this, <laughs> go here, you know, and, and I'm very, very grateful for that because of, it, New York is a really rough place and it can be very dangerous. And, and the weird thing is, is that I worked in a lot of places where the mafia was involved and all kinds of stuff and had no, like, no clue. I'm talking to mobsters and I'm telling them like, oh, you We're need to do unaware. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need to do this and I want more money and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, um, you know, uh, <laughs> ignorance is bliss, I guess. <laughs> How has your relationship with drag changed? Um, huh. I left Florida thinking I wasn't going to do drag ever again. Uh, I, I traded, yeah, I, I trade in 1990, I traded all of my drag for an old car, uh, a 1972 Grandville. And I called it the land yacht. It was so big, oh, like it was this huge, huge car. And uh, uh, I mean, you could probably put like two or three dead bodies in the back, uh, in the in the uh, in the trunk. That's how big it was. And uh, um, I had no, I didn't have a license. I, I was driving around with no license, but I would only drive it at night because I was afraid. And I only took back roads. Sorry, sorry. You didn't have a license, so you thought, I'm scared of driving, so I'll only drive at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I, I remember I traded um, uh, this queen. Her name was Re Regina Real, and I still talk to her to this day. We uh, actually went to high school together, wow. uh, and um, uh, I knew her when she was Reggie. Uh, and uh, um, I traded my clothes, uh, my old drag clothes to her for this car. And I ran, I drove it until it stopped running for like, it ran for about like six or seven months and then it died. 
So when I got to New York, I was just like, you know, I'm not doing drag. I'm going to be a DJ. That was my big thing. Big serious uh, career. Yeah. And so, but uh, as soon as I started performing at uh, Sally's and, uh, you know, people started asking, oh, you know, and it's my choice of music also because of, um, I believe that night I did um, a Millie Jackson song. And if you're not familiar with her, she's a very underrated R&B singer from like the 70s and 80s. But uh, she just, she, when, when she did a cover of something, she made it her own. She always had like a monologue or something that went into it. And I think it influenced how I record music now because of when I make songs or even if I do a cover or whatever, I somehow try and interject something that I want to say into the song. And uh, so I kind of learned that from doing her material. Uh, but like I, you know, I was always fond of like the classics, uh, Eartha Kitt, Della Reese. Um, I love Eartha Kitt. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was just all of those things. I was like, oh, they, they just seemed glamorous and very fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, while everyone else was doing Whitney Houston and Patti LaBelle and all that other stuff, I was just like, no, I want to do these things. And there really wasn't a space for that in, like there were a handful of people who appreciated that, that style of music. But when I got to New York, it actually made me stand out even more. So right. yeah, I, yeah, it was a novelty thing because if I was doing something completely opposite, so I would show up at these talent shows and do an Eartha Kit number and everybody's like, whoa, you know, you know I'm lip syncing in J Japanese or, you know, something like that. And, Everyone's like looking like, what the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they were intrigued. So it, right. it really, it really helped me. Um, uh, so the style of drag that I learned back in Florida actually helped uh, like keep me relevant on the scene in New York, even though I didn't really perform that often. Um, the first few years that I was there, I spent more time just showing up places in drag just to be seen. So I'd go to the limelight, I would go, you know, uh, to the Palladium, to different places, just to be seen. Um, because if you got the doorman's attention, then you got rushed in and, oh, you know, you know, so I, I, I was really trying to be seen and that that's, it worked, you know. Uh, there used to be a club called Club USA in Times Square. And uh, that was a great club, actually, if you've ever seen salt and pepper's video for shoop i i've never seen the video actually oh okay well there's a shot of them on a big stage doing a dance routine that's in club usa and uh i used to love that club i always wanted to perform there but like i never got to i like it was a venue for like actual like recording artists right, so okay. like you know so you would go and see someone like robin s or C.C. Penniston or someone like that, they would perform there. Like, you know, people who had hits uh, uh, that were on the charts, they would perform there. So going so. from leaving Florida thinking you'd never do drag again, <laughs> here you are today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I, I, I really, the transition of doing drag there, doing recordings, like once I started recording records, um, my first record uh, that got signed was Why Are You Gagging? And um, it was on Progressive High Records, which was actually a division of Atlantic Records. Uh, so it was a big deal at the time. Like mm -hmm. I was, oh my God, because they only signed a few artists before the label folded. Uh, but uh, so my first record came out on that. And uh, I, you know, as every first record deal, I got screwed royally. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't even take me out to dinner. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but what happened with that record was they basically handed me and the producer like a couple of thousand dollars and we got nothing else after that. The record, uh, they took the, the vocals, had them remixed overseas and released the song over in Europe and over in other places. I knew nothing about it. Uh, the, the records that they pressed a bunch of records and I saw them in record stores in New York. Uh, but apparently the biggest place that my record sold was in Atlanta. I had no clue. If I had known, I would have tried to go there to perform. Right. 
Uh, so I was getting a following, but really nobody really knew what I looked like or who I was. Uh, and then um, uh, because they sold the record over in Europe, um, I got contacted, or well, actually one of my friends, MJ White, he was my best friend and he's no longer with us, but he was signed to a label and there was a little buzz. So they signed me and uh, they had an office in the World Trade Center. So this is around 2000. And uh, I actually recorded a whole album and had stuff ready and we were marketing. They were going to try and make me the, the RuPaul of the UK. They were right. gonna like push that as the narrative. Uh, and 9-11 uh, happened and everything fell through. So I had this whole album that I had done. I had done a cover of Proud Mary and I had done uh, like a whole bunch of bitch tracks. Oh, the style of music that uh, I'm known for uh, in the ballroom scene is called bitch tracks. And it's usually the stuff that they either do runway to or they vogue to. Uh, and uh, so I- For someone of, who might not be as familiar, what is a bitch track? A bitch track is, okay, what, uh, some people would de describe it as some some queen rambling on a on a microphone on a, <laughs> but it it actually has a, a it has a purpose. My my husband sort of when I met him he sort of explained it in a way that I had never thought about it. But it's it's like black gay folk music in a way. It 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 encompasses what the ballroom scene is. What they're talking about on the record is about what is happening in the ballroom. And it can be applied to other things. A lot of the lingo from bitch tracks has become, you know, pop culture and part right. of the scene now. But, you know, the, all of the, the ballroom has a, an energy about it. So to capture that on record, you know, you, that's, that's really what a bitch track is about. It's about that moment. So why are you gagging? I don't sing on it. I'm talking. I'm actually saying stuff and I'm making references. I made the record um, because I was DJing at an after hours place called Jay's and Kevin Aviance and um, uh, Franklin Fuentes. These were two big names at the time. Franklin Fuentes did a song called If Madonna Calls with Junior Vasquez. Huge, huge song. And, and um, he uh, it just says, if Madonna calls, I'm not here. That's all it says, really. <laughs> but, uh, and Kevin Aviance did like a cover of Dendada and did a song called Kanti. So these were huge hits. And I'm DJing in this after hours place and they used to come in and I used to try and talk to them or see if I could get promos out of them of their upcoming stuff. And they were so rude to me. They were really, really rude to me. So I was, uh, I started working on music with my uh, friend Calvin Roberts. And I was telling him about this and I was like, I really wish I could get back at them or whatever. So we recorded what I wanted to say to them uh, so I could play it at, at the after hours. And that's what it was recorded for. It wasn't recorded really to be signed. So I make a reference to Franklin's records in it. And I made a reference to Kevin's record, Cunty. Uh, and, uh, and I'm reading them, but I'm not naming them. Right. So it could apply to anyone. And, and so that sort of kind of caught on. So the next thing that I recorded was a, a track called Bitch You Look Fierce. And uh, I, in my mind, I was taking the word fierce back to the, its original meaning, something bad. But in the ballroom scene, fierce is good. Like a right. thing that was fierce. So the, I, I took it back to its original meaning. And I'm, I'm talking about, um, uh, I say, oh, Miss Thing, if, uh, um, uh, you look, uh, you think you look like Naomi Campbell, but you look more like Glenn Campbell. Uh, and, and, and the weird thing is they didn't even know who Glenn Campbell like was. the big band. No, no, no. Glenn Campbell is a country artist. Oh, I'm thinking uh, Glenn Miller. Sorry. Yeah, you're thinking of Glenn Miller. Uh, yeah. So, but I had all these references. I had this thing about, I said something about Mariah Carey and I said, no more like Jim Carey. Uh, like, so I have all these things that I'm saying that are really bad things, but because I'm saying bitch you look fierce, they totally like caught on, they loved it. And it became an underground hit. Okay, so this is a really funny story about uh, my husband and I. Um, Wonderful. When, when, when we met, uh, 
uh, this is in 2005. Uh, I was booked in Montreal and I'm there for a DJ gig and drag shows. And it states, you know, it's the daytime, early evening. And I'm like, oh, let me walk around or whatever. I stop in this place that I think is a, a coffee shop, which it is a coffee shop, but I didn't know it was also an art gallery. So there's all of this art everywhere. He's there because of he's an HIV positive artist and they have all these uh, HIV positive artists uh, displaying their work or whatever. So there's um, a, uh, some picture of some, someone's ass with a rash on it. And I was like, what the, why would someone put that up? I was like, what is this? And I'm talking to this guy and I'm like, this is, you know, I could see the other art, I understand, but like, what is this? And he, yeah, he's just looking at me and he's kind of laughing or whatever. Finally, he tells me it's his work. <laughs> and it's his ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, what were your next nice words? <laughs> yeah, yeah, open mouth, insert foot. So, uh, so, but we, I think he liked me because of, I just, I wasn't into the whole thing. He thought it was hysterical. And we ended up hooking up. And, uh, and so, you know, thus began our relationship. Uh, it was a long distance thing. We lost touch. We got back uh, in touch uh, 2009. Uh, and then uh, at the end of 2009, uh, World AIDS Day, he proposed. Uh, and uh, I was like, wow. And uh, uh, marriage wasn't an option in the States at that time. So I said yes, and I moved to Toronto. So that's how I got here. I didn't uh, know that you that you kind of got here. I, I know that it had to do with your husband, but I hadn't pieced together that it was because marriage equality still wasn't legal in the U.S. for another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so and, and I'm sorry. I told you all of that to tell you that he was looking for the person. He was looking for Jade Electra uh, oh, no because, because he's working on, he was working on a film and he wanted to use the song in the film. So, you know, I didn't tell him that I did drag immediately. <laughs> uh, so, so we're talking and I tell him, you know, oh, I'm, I'm this queen, I'm Jade Electra or whatever. And he's like, oh my God, <laughs> I've, I've, been, I've wanted to use your song in my movie. This is amazing. <laughs> So yeah, um, incredible. <laughs> What's something that you wish younger queens knew? Um, hmm. I wish a lot of the younger queens knew how important talent shows are. Hmm. Talent shows are the springboard for a drag career. This is where you really learn what what it is that you have to bring to the table if you can't if you can't survive a talent show like now people just kind of self-proclaim i'm this person or this queen and you can be whoever you want online but it is different being in front of a group of people mm. like having a, everyone's attention at once what are you going to do in that moment can you pull it off are you a dancer are you an actor are you, you know, because there's some acting ability that has to go into what it is that you're doing. It's not just moving your mouth and walking side to side. You have to become that number, whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, so I wish, I wish that, you know, the younger queens today actually understood the importance of a talent show and being in front of an actual audience. I, the, the being online, I'd like, I've been asked to do a lot of stuff online and I don't mind speaking online or whatever, but I'm not big on performing online only because of, I like the, the feel of having people in front of me. That's um, energy. Yeah. The energy and the, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's almost like when I'm DJing, it's a conversation between you and your audience and how you give to that conversation is how successful you're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it's good to, fail it's good to fall on your face uh in front of a bunch of people because you learn about yourself i mean my first um performance was hideous i was uh i had no one to help me i knew nothing about makeup so 
I didn't even wear foundation or anything. I had lipstick and I put that on and I rubbed some on my fingers and rubbed it on my cheeks for, for some rouge. And uh, I had a jerry curl because it was the 80s. So I didn't wear a wig. And uh, I had props. I did, I did think of props. So I did How Come You Don't Call Me Anymore, which is a Prince song, but by before Stephanie. Props before makeup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had a telephone with me and I had a framed photograph of Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> so the first line is, I keep your picture by my bed. Uh, and, you know, and the song is How Come You Don't Call Me. So when, you know, I picked up the picture and held it and all this stuff, you know, but I look so ridiculous that they howled like the, the, the laughter was so loud at one point, I couldn't hear the music. That's how loud it was. And in that moment, and because of I knew how this crowd was, I had been there to watch the show. If you if they got you and, and like spooked you and you ran off the stage, you can never show your face there. So I had to sit through that number. And that was tough. That was like four minutes of just pure hell of just them laughing and, and you know, and looking at me and like, there was an instigator in the audience. Uh, we called him uh, Sally Mae Sasquatch because he was really tall and he had huge feet. And uh, he was the worst. He like came up to the stage and was pointing at me and laughing and looking back like, look at this. I, oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. But I got through it and I showed up again and again and again, <laughs> you know, I, because of, I, I had to show them that I wasn't afraid mm. and also that I had something to offer. And each time I got a little better and uh, a queen took me under her wing, uh, Tony Rose was her name. She gave me like my first wig. She gave me my first tutorial on makeup and she was a white queen, uh, which is, you know, how many white queens know how to do black makeup if they, you know, that, that was something that was unheard of at that moment for me. Right. Uh, and um, it was uh, literally, again, it, it goes back to mentoring the people who helped along the way. So I'm, I'm very fortunate and blessed to still be here. And I'm very fortunate to be able to talk to you and and try and very you know. fortunate <laughs> so pleasure yeah. is all mine i assure you <laughs> well so but yeah um it was i don't know i i i like i like the journey that i took in drag mm -hmm. because of it it went from wanting to perform to actually using it towards something so you know um uh gosh it it seems like it was only yesterday, but it was a couple of years ago now. Um, when I did uh, Undetectable at the AIDS Memorial uh, here in Toronto, um, it was a moment that I wasn't expecting. Uh, I, I, I was afraid to do the song. I thought that someone was going to be offended and thought that I was mocking, uh, you know, being HIV positive. Uh, but from the second, and you know, it, it's funny watching the video for it because of I know what's going on in my head and what was going on. I my uh, the what you call it uh, at the moment that I was performing, uh, my breasts were slightly sliding. There was all this stuff that was going on that I'm freaking out because of. I'm like, oh my god, I'm standing in front of everyone, and things are beginning to shift and move, and the music starts and I'm like, oh God, I hope they don't hate me or someone says something or whatever. And I give the first word, undetectable. And then all of a sudden it was just this big, warm reception. Like everyone was just right there with me. So I just did the number. And uh, after I finished the number, I, you know, everyone cheered or whatever, but I was walking back to get into the 519 and someone stopped me this and, really caught me off guard because it wasn't what I was thinking in my head, but he said, because of I did it as um, my, my idols uh, for, for drag or Ginger from Gilligan's Island, uh, which I, I don't, you probably don't even know that show. I uh, did know the show, but it is oh, a wee bit before my time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, she was a redhead. I'm fond of red hair for myself. 
uh, but she was kind of a poor man's Marilyn Monroe. So I had that kind of feel to when I sang it. Uh, and he said, this guy stopped me and he said, thank you for making me feel sexy again. Cause I hadn't like, that wasn't what I was thinking, but like, that's what he got from it was that like his sexuality was awakened by the fact that I was HIV positive. I was there in that moment saying, talking about you equals you unapologetic, um, uh, a, a friend of mine named Mark Henderson was standing next to the mayor and the mayor thought that it was a bro uh, Tory thought yeah. that this was the most brilliant way of getting the message out and said so to him. And I was like, wow, I didn't even realize the mayor was there. Um, and, and so, and then the, the, someone took a video, they put it online. Uh, and, you know, I started getting all these messages and, Oh my God, this is great. And, uh, you know, you, I was tagged on it. I was like, okay, great. So then I get a phone call from Mark S. King and he's like, uh, can I interview you about it? I was like, sure. He interviews me and he posts the interview and the next day it goes viral. Like it's all over the place and everyone's like liking and sharing and, and I'm like, what's going on? Like it was, <laughs> you know, and I had already done this parody once before and I didn't get, I think it was an okay reception, but it wasn't that kind of reception. Uh, so to get like this big, huge thing going on. And then the next thing I know, uh, Mark connects me with the, uh, the head of the, the largest AIDS conference in the States. Uh, and they're asking me, to, uh, would I come and do the number? I'm like, sure. Yeah. So they fly me and my husband down. They put us up in this fabulous suite. Uh, I got tickets to the entire conference. So we got to go to all these different things and meet different people and all this stuff. Uh, and I didn't realize that they were booking me as the finale. So I was the finale. You of, didn't even know that you were kind of the headline as it were. Yeah, I didn't know that. I just thought that I was going to be somewhere in the thing, but I, I was the closing right. before they did the big, like everybody on stage. Uh, and, uh, it was, it was amazing. There were close to like, probably about like 2000 people there. So, uh, audience you've ever live audience you've ever performed for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I, I've seen the undetectable video and you're, you're so sensual and confident talking about this really intimate and I guess stigmatized aspect of like male sexuality with living HIV positive. So I definitely well, understand why people gave you such a positive perception. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing is, is that like I've, I myself, I've never apologized. I, mm. I disclose to all of my partners and people who like I dated or whatever. Uh, I, I actually used to have a, a system because of uh, coming out to them was, um, uh, I, I had a diner uh, uh, that I used to go to uh, the Waverly Diner around the corner from uh, Stonewall and the Monster uh, in Greenwich Village. And they had my headshot of me and drag on the wall. So I would normally sit close by it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so the first thing I would do is disclose that I did drag and I would point out the picture. Now, if they had a problem with that, most likely they were going to have a problem with me being HIV positive. So that was the, you know, the like buffer. The <laughs> yeah so so that was my system of how i came out to people was this diner i would take them there and we would sit and uh you know have a meal and casually talk about stuff and then you know i've this kind of connects to something i've heard you talk before about but the value of being one's authentic self as a political act what makes that authenticity so important um there's a freedom. Uh, there, there's a freedom that you have. You, you're not shackled by the stigma. You're not shackled by the judgment because of you've said all you need to say. I am HIV positive. I am gay. I'm black. I'm, you know, I'm all of these things. And what, what are you going to say after that? That's the, that's what's so important about it. Once you can get to that state, no one can stop you. No one can 
deter you from whatever it is that you're working on or whatever, because of, you've already told them all the things that they thought was going to be shameful. So, you know, and I'm pretty much an open book. I don't, you know, like, I have no filter about like my life or whatever that, or, you know, I mean, there's certain things I will not share or whatever, uh, but like in general, who I am, I try to be this person every day, you know, whether I'm in drag or out of drag or whatever, I'm a little more quieter, I think, and, uh, you know, out of drag. Um, uh, not as much as I talked the other day on the other taping, though, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I, 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 it's, it's important because you have to, you have to stand in your truth. If mm -hmm. once you do that, there is just, you know, there's not, there's no other obstacles. Once you stand in your truth, there is no other obstacles. That was beautiful. Listen, you're a singer, actor, producer, recording artist, HIV AIDS activist. How can we, like the audience, help you do what you do? Um, well, you know, that's funny that you should ask because I just started, well, I didn't just start. I started a while ago, but I need to pick it back up um, because of, I think it's important. Um, uh, I have a campaign that I started called HIV is everyone's business. And I need everyone to be a part of it. Like you don't have to be HIV positive, but I want people to show their faces with our slogan and, you know, give a, a, a you know, a, a one sentence quote, something about HIV or, or the stigma or any of that. Um, so to show that you stand with the people who are HIV positive and that you are committed to fighting the stigma. Um, once it becomes a common thing that we're all talking about, then there is no stigma. Exactly. It's, you know, they're, they're, it's just like everything. I mean, it is mind blowing coming from my generation of HIV to see a commercial on television for medicine for HIV for the meds. Mm. Like that is something that I would have never have dreamed I would have seen in my lifetime. That is amazing. Um, and so, you know, that's helping normalize things, but we all need to start having these conversations. I was in a, a, on a panel earlier today, and that was one of the things that I was talking about is that the conversations and mentoring and um, getting people to actually sit down and talk about stuff would change everything. We're so busy internalizing everything and, you know, we might say something online or whatever, but saying it face to face or confronting, you know, things like stigma and uh, bullying and all of those things. If we talked about those things more often, they wouldn't happen. So stigma is like born of the taboo. Yeah. You know, um, I, it's really weird. I, I had a friend of mine ask me, like, aren't you worried about like your social media? Like you're just out there. Everyone knows that you're HIV positive. It's on your profile, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm not worried. Um, you know, people, I, for whatever reason, I think because I'm so out about it and I'm just a matter of fact, mm -hmm. um, people respect that. So they know the line. They know not, you know, and of course, you're going to get a uh, jerk here and there. I was about to say a bad word. Um, <laughs> Listen, there might be a few bleeps during this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, you know, and you deal with them in the moment or whatever. But for the most part, most people are very respectful um, because of they realize that the what it takes to be out and to stand up and, and say that this is what's going on. And... I'm not going to tolerate the hatred. I'm not going to tolerate the, the you know, any of that. It's, it's just, it's not, you're not going to get away with it with me. So don't, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for you today. Thank ah, you so much. Sure. Um, that was, that was brilliant. Um, I really appreciate you coming to talk to me, not once, but twice. <laughs> One time in full drag, no less. Um, <laughs> as you can see, I got a little bit dressed up for you because this is the only other occasion I've had to wear this outfit other than the grocery uh, store. <laughs> so. 
Oh, well, trust me, because this is Zoom. Uh, no pantyhose, no, <laughs> <laughs> no high heels, no nothing, some socks. <laughs> you this is the easiest drag. I, lo I love drag online like this. <laughs> Just figure out what the framing is and whatever the cutoff is, like sweatpants down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I wish I could push the camera back just a little bit more so, so you know, the breasticles could be up <laughs> and out, but, um, but this is fine. <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to me today and for sharing your story. Um, I'm obviously a huge fan of yours, and I'm hoping through this I can make more people huge fans of yours as well. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, I, I'm still blown away that a, a, a silly conversation uh, at the Beaver, <laughs> you remembered it. Uh, that was a while ago. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored. So thank you.